And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest today is Diane Sherman, who through her near-death experience was able to find her passion, purpose, and joy. Diane, thanks for joining me and welcome. Thanks, Jeff. It's lovely to be here. So Diane, if you don't mind, let's just start on the day that it happened and go from there. The day that it happened, I went into the hospital to have a simple arthroscopic procedure on my left knee. I had waited 10 years to have this because I didn't want to have the big patella surgery. And so this was the day I had been waiting for a long time because I had an accident in Mexico with my husband swimming, which is weird, and ended up with a lot of damage in my knee. So I am sitting on a gurney waiting outside of the OR. And I hadn't had a pre-op shot yet, but I started shaking, just racking with cold. And as I look back on it, it's almost like kind of a foretelling of something that was coming. And I I was really comfortable having the surgery. I liked my doctor. I thought he was a really good, safe guy. So I had all the right feelings and intentions going into this. But my body just kept racking. And one of the nurses came up to me and she said, would it help if I got you a warmed blanket? I said, oh, yeah, that would be wonderful. Who knew that they had things like that in the hospital? And so she went and got the blanket, brought it to me, and that immediately calmed my body down. Now, this is 1981, okay? Long time ago. Um, They did things differently than they do now, of course, you know. But at the time, um, it seemed very straightforward and and okay. Um, My body calmed down. We went into the operating room and... They put a second blanket on me. And all of a sudden, my body just relaxed. And I went out. I went out before they gave me a shot, before they put me under. I was already out, which is pretty strange. But things being what they were, um, I remember waking up in recovery. And I hear this commotion next to me now you know I'm coming out of anesthesia I'm not sure where I am and there's this commotion to the left of me and I hear them saying to the person um Diane wake up Diane wake up and I'm thinking to myself how interesting that that person has the same name that I have But I didn't think anything about it. And I'm still kind of trying to be in myself and whatnot. And there's more activity, more people. And now I'm hearing them saying, Diane Sherman, wake up. Diane Sherman, wake up. And I I, I was so shocked because they were calling my name. And and I, I raised my hand and I said, wait a minute, that's me. I'm here. And I thought, oh my God, did they do the wrong surgery on them or me or whatever? What's happening? And they're not paying any attention to me. And I thought, well, they're trying to save this person. So I can understand why they're not paying attention to me when I'm trying to wave and get their attention. And the next thing I know, I'm standing at the bottom of this person's bed, looking up at them, and it's me. And even though I knew it was me, I had no connection to her at all. It was as if somebody had said, pass the salt. It was just neutral. There was no energy on it. There was no fear. There was no curiosity. There was no... There was just no connection. And as I'm watching them, I'm looking down and I'm noticing, wait a minute, I'm here. I'm standing here. I see me standing here, but 
but I see her. And I'm watching what they're doing to her and I'm realizing that she's gone. There's something really seriously happening here. The next thing I know, I feel myself being extricated up into the corner of the room. Now I'm looking down over everybody and her and what they're doing to her. And, and I'm kind of fascinated by it, but I'm not, I'm not upset. I don't have any interest in what the outcome there is. I'm just notating it. And the next thing I know, I'm being pulled out of this area. And it feels like I've left the space and now there's something pushing me forward. And every time I say this, I can feel my body arch back away from it because I didn't I didn't want to go forward. And I'm going into darkness. And then I'm going into blackness. And the thing when I was a kid that scared me the most was being in the dark. Was possibly being blind. Not being able to see what was coming at me. I had a difficult childhood. I had trauma in childhood. And so the ability to not see was more frightening than anything. And so here I am in this abject blackness. And the blackness wasn't doing anything to me. It was just the childhood fear coming up that was terrorizing to me. And in that experience, I think to myself, you know, if I can find one glimmer of light just one glimmer of light, I know I'm going to be okay. So I'm just hyper-focusing on finding that glimmer of light out there. It's almost like the pin light that I'm seeing on my computer, which is where the camera is. It's that little tiny pinpoint of light, and I'm, I'm hyper-focused on it, and it's almost like I'm trying to draw it into me so that I feel safe. And all of a sudden, I'm closer to it, and it's getting bigger, and I'm closer to it, and it's getting bigger, and now it's it's taking over, and I'm in this this diaphanous divine light that I've never seen before in my life. <clears throat> There's no word for me to describe the color of this. It's luminescent. It's alive. It's, it's magnificent in every shape and form of it. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. I, it's just, it's everything. And as I'm feeling surrounded by it, I'm feeling love. I'm feeling safety. And as I'm moving with the light, I'm starting to move through it. It's almost like it's parting. And I'm looking all around because everything is the light. And it's like being in these clouds. It's like being, if we could be in clouds, which you can't because it's vapor and all that. It's like being in clouds, but not wet, not cold, but just yummy. It was yummy. So now, it starts to part. The light starts to part in front of me. And I'm like literally floating, which at the time kind of made me almost chuckle to myself because it was like right out of a movie. I'm sort of floating forward in this light and the light is separating. And what appears in front of me are two rows of monks in monks robes with the hoods up like six or eight on either side and I'm floating between them and as I'm floating between them I'm feeling all of this love so much love so much gentleness and tenderness and 
I'm not shocked to see them. I was raised Catholic, 12 years of Catholic school. So a monk to me was like the gentlest part of the religion. Not the priests, but the monks. And as I get to sort of the front of the line of these monks, the one on the left steps forward. And he, I always say he, uh, says to me, it's not your time, you cannot stay. Now, when I look at this being, there's no face in this hood. There's no face. It's almost like the screen behind you that has the, the universe, lights, dots, stars, and all of that. That's what it looked like, but it was moving. All of that was moving in this space where his face would be. All this energy was moving. But he seemed so familiar to me. And he seemed so safe to me. And he had all those lovely attributes of a good man. You know, he was fatherly. He was powerful and in charge and safe and taking care of and wise and, you know, knew how to operate. You know, so I could relax because I didn't know where what was happening. But his energy made all of this feel so right. And he looks at me and he says, you cannot stay. You must go back. It's not your time. And I said, I, I'm, I'm feeling loved for the first time in my life. Unconditionally. I'm feeling cherished, which I've never felt before. I, I've been married. I have a child. I, I never felt those things in those relationships, the way I'm feeling it here and now with him. And I said, you cannot send me back. I finally found home. And he said, but it's not your time. You must go back. And I said, why? Why would I come here, have this, and then have to go back? He said, you cannot stay. You have a child. You must go back. My daughter was six years old at that time. And I started thinking about who would I want to take care of her and love her the way I loved her. I knew my ex-husband wasn't an option because he was my ex-husband for a reason. My parents were both dead. My sister was mentally unstable. I really didn't have anybody that I felt could take on the responsibility and love her and be there for her and show her the world the way I knew she needed to see it. And in that instant, I'm back in my body. When I woke up in recovery, I really didn't know for sure what had happened to me. But I knew I was different. There was just something inside of me that had shifted and changed. And the doctor got me up walking that night and they did massive work. The reason I flatlined is they had me on the operating table almost two hours longer than they were going to. Because they didn't know until they got in there to see how much damage there was. And I was very thin at that time and had low blood pressure. And so it was almost like a perfect opportunity to float out of my body. And I don't know if I wanted to go intentionally out or if it was just the circumstances. And I'll never know, you know. But um, I had no pain after the surgery with all that they did to me and had me walking that night. And the woman that I was in the hospital room with she had arthroscopy, but not as detailed or as big a job of fixing her stuff as mine. And she was in excruciating pain. And my doctor said he'd never seen anybody heal the way I healed. And that was part of the gift of the NDE, it was not being in pain and not being in distress. And Diane, thank you for sharing your experience with us. When you looked at your body and then you looked at yourself, did you see like a ghost version of yourself as well? No, 
No, that's what was so surprising to me. I saw myself dressed. I saw myself in clothing and fully there. I was not, you know, um, couldn't I couldn't see through myself or anything like that. No, it was fully me there. And that was fully me there. You said that you weren't connected to the body. Right. But did you understand that that was you? I did. I knew that was me. And yet, it. I think on some level now, I know so much more now than I did then. I know that was the ego part of me, you know, that body and the ego and all of that. And I know now I am not my body. I am not my ego. Except on days when I lost my mind, you know, as a human being. But at the time, I, there was an understanding of this is okay to be separate from that. This is this is absolutely okay. There's nothing wrong here. There's nothing scary here. Do you think you also separated from the identity of Diane Sherman? Oh, absolutely. I've never had anybody ask me that question, but yes, absolutely. Right. And that was the that was the the reason there was no connection. All right. When you went to the light, you described the light as being alive. Can you expand yeah. on that? I'll try. I don't know if I have words for it. It's all feeling, you know, sensing and feeling. Um, it it was energy that was just there and gentle and supportive and nurturing and I notice you're moving your hands. Would you say that the light was pulsating? Yes, it, that was the energy. It was it was moving and flowing and caressing and supporting, and it, you know it was doing everything that I was needing. It was totally being there for me. It was like, and I've never said this before. It was like having the spotlight on me and all of my needs and wants in that moment. And having this beautiful energy supporting that and taking care of that and giving me that. Was it a white light or a golden light? For me, it was white, luminescent. Um, there, there were so many colors in the white. You know, we don't have white like that. It wasn't flat. It wasn't shiny. It was... It was like undulating it, it, as, as, as the white got caught by light and, and the light got caught by the white. And it was just, it was like this dance it did. This, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It was just, it was thrilling and calming and uplifting and soothing. It was everything. Would you say it was healing you? Oh, yes. Yes. And an interesting aside, when I was with the monks, there was this sense of awareness, of knowledge of how the world works and what things mean. And it was like having world wisdom, you know, universal wisdom. You knew the answer to almost everything. Did you bring any of that back with you? I brought wisdom back with me. I'm not sure it's mine as much as it is spirit and the way spirit supports me in my life and my work i'm in contact i'm what i would call a conscious channel i'm always in connection so when i need to know something um it comes through you know because i came back with clear ascensions clear audience clairvoyance you know the knowing what can't be known and all that stuff i came back with that ability and I attribute that to my connection to spirit. It's not me. You know, I'm just the conduit for it. Now, you didn't have those abilities before your NDE. I mean, I was intuitive, but not, not like this. I mean, when I, when I was um, able to go out to restaurants and stuff after my surgery, I remember walking into a restaurant with my sister and all of a sudden, I could hear and feel everybody's story, everybody feel everybody's pain, know everybody's everything. And it was like all of this information and 
it was loud. I mean, it was just like thundering at me. And I thought, oh my God, am I becoming psychotic? What is wrong with me? I had no idea because at that time I had never heard of a near death experience. You mentioned that you were flatlined. Does that mean that your heart stopped and you were clinically dead? Yeah. You were raised Catholic. I was. After your NDE, did you get more into Catholicism? You would think, if you're a religious person, you would think. Um, I walked away from the church. It, it shocked me that how much I had been raised with and, and believed in was a lie for me. Because for me, the way I was raised um, in the 50s, 60s in the church, it was all about fear. It was all about judgment. It was all about punishment. And the one thing that really, really hit home for me is that there is absolutely no judgment whatsoever on us. It's only love. It's only unconditional love. And it doesn't matter who we are and what we do. We are loved. We will always be loved. Do you think that you saw monks or they presented themselves as monks to make you more comfortable? I think the latter. I don't necessarily think they were monks. But it was an analogous thing for me to see that made me comfortable. You know, a lot of people see family. They see Jesus. They see other things. I did not. I think they gave me what was good for me, you know, what I could relate to. Can you remember any direct words of wisdom or lessons or anything profound from your NDE when you received that knowledge of the world or everything? Yeah, I think one of the things that was important for me to know was that besides the fact that we are loved unconditionally, that there's no judgment on us, and that why are we judging ourselves so harshly? Because we all do as human beings, and we need to stop that. It's so counterproductive, and it's not what the universe wants for us. The other thing is, we, now, the Catholic Church, in my time of being reared there, we were uh, made in the image and likeness of God. Well, what I got when I was on the other side is we are an extension of the God force. We have the same power to create. We are not lowly beings that, you know, have to work hard and, and, and pray a lot to have the things that we are needing and wanting. That's a given. It's like, that's our birthright. It, it, it should have been a tattoo on our behind so that we'd remember it. Um, and we have to just keep knowing that because we're loved, we're so encouraged by the other side. I mean, they just want the best for us all the time because as, as we grow and change, we expand the universe. You know, that's part of why we're here is, is, our silly humanness helps to expand the universe and, and create new things. And God always wanted to experience God's self and God experiences everything through us. And there's such love and gratitude for us on the other side. And I don't think human beings can take that in. I know when I go into meditation and I have a very strong connection in that meditation that day. It's so humbling to me to feel the love, to feel the connection, that it makes me cry. And it's a very vulnerable thing to feel. And I, I don't think most people know that that's available to them or that they would be worthy of that. And it breaks my heart to see people not knowing how amazing they are not knowing how cherished they really are because we've all had these childhood experiences that gave us perceptions about who we are. And nine times out of 10, those perceptions are wrong because children never can say my parents are wrong. 
because that would emotionally abandon them to that parent. And they need their parent. I think that's part of the work that I love the most is helping people heal those inner parts of them, their, their little kid selves that are took a hit somewhere along the line. And what that meant. The hit came because of parents, not because of anything the child did, because they're children, right? Kids are perfect. Yes, they can be challenging and whatnot, but kids are amazing beings. And for them to grow up not knowing that is the, the travesty for me. Because one of the gifts I came back with is I get to see people in their essence. In other words, when I look at you, Jeff, I don't see the facade. I see you at the core and how precious you are. And I want you to know that about you. Do you think that we are God in the human form or there's a piece of God's energy within us that animates us perhaps, but we're still separate from God? I think we're separate from God in our, in our thinking. I think our essence, our high selves, are just a part of that energy. And when we die, that energy goes back to the original energy. Um, I don't think we'll ever be powerful in the way God is powerful, because we have this human construct that keeps us in a certain position. And maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. But I think the point is, is to to know yourself beyond just being a human being with degrees or whatever you have that allows you as an adult to go forward and be successful in the world. I think you need to know that you've got a lot more going for you. It's like the, when we were kids, pretending, being in the magic. As a girl, that was a big deal for me. Um, maybe because... On some level, I knew it. You know, I'm, I, I grapple with the fact of whether I had an ND when I was a kid. Because I was such a pious kid, which was unusual and not normal. And certainly not with the parents that I had and whatnot. But I had an understanding about God. And I've always believed that... There is this energy that is there for me on all levels at all times. I just, at times in my life, have forgotten it. And before I had my NDE, I was going through a really dark time. And I had found myself going to church one day and just begging and pleading to God, please show me, guide me, do something. I'm stuck because I was divorced. I had the six-year-old little girl. I, I was no longer modeling. I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. I was so lost. My life had not worked in the way I thought it was going to. And I, I didn't know what was available to me. And I didn't have parents to go talk to about it and all that stuff. And it was in less than a week when I had my knee surgery and my near-death experience. And that changed everything for me. You know, through this experience, I, I've become um, a spiritual life coach, an intuitive counselor, a vibrational healer, and I've got clients all over the world, which I wouldn't have had had I not had this experience, had I not known to stop me jerking through my life, get out of my ego, get out of my fear, and see what's really there for me. And I'm so grateful for it. You said on the other side, they're rooting for us. Yes. Are we having these experiences for them on the other side? I think so. I mean, I think, well, here's a human experience that I can relate to that. Whenever anybody I know has something wonderful happening to, me, to them, that uplifts me. Their news uplifts me. So it's the same on the other side. You know, when when something wonderful is occurring for us and our lives are going well and our thoughts are flowing properly to support us and whatnot, there's great joy on the other side. I think it does uplift them. I think it does expand them. Why do you think so many people on this side are unhappy? 
because they're listening to their monkey minds and the monkey mind is constantly telling them what's wrong with them and that they'll never be good enough and they'll never be this enough or that enough. And I don't know why we have that. I don't quite understand it. I think that's part of what we need to process through. But I, I have learned to step away from it. I don't hear it. Only occasionally when something kind of traumatic comes, then I'll hear it. But other than that, I don't hear it because I live in trust. I really do. I I don't make decisions about what I'm going to wear. I don't make decisions about where I'm going, what I'm doing. It's all intuition for me. And as long as I follow my intuition, my life flows beautifully. It allows me to stay in my heart. It allows me to feel loved. Because I'm not up here going, oh my God, do you know what you just did wrong? Or why did you do it that way? Or you're really messing up here. You know, I don't do that. I know that everything that happens is happening for a reason. There is a rhyme and reason to the universe. I don't understand it all. And I won't until I'm back on the other side. But I'm here trusting in it. And it's the trust in it that allows me to flow in life differently. What kind of advice would you give someone who recently lost a loved one in their life to the other side? Well, I'm the worst person when it comes to death and dying because I'm always so thrilled for the person who gets to go. I mean, all I can tell them is that they are, first of all, there's education and hospital on the other side. So whatever shape they're in when they transpire, they are so lovingly scooped up and taken care of and and given back the parts of themselves they've forgotten and the the pain and suffering that they've carried and, and the resentments or angers or whatever that they have, all of that's taken care of. You know? So it's a gift. It's an absolute blessing. And they haven't lost them. They still can communicate with them. They're not gone. They're just physically not here. But they certainly can communicate with you. You just have to trust and believe in that. It's it's And it's not magical thinking. It's real. They're, they're in a different vibratory frequency. But that doesn't mean they're not there. All we have to do is think of them and that calls them in. I'm assuming then that you don't fear death. No. And I'm so grateful that I'm at the age where it's getting closer. I've had a magnificent life. I've had so many things that I never thought I would experience or or see or do. And I'm excited about what the next level is for me on the other side. You know, the world is getting more painful. And I see more of the pain and I know it's not going to stay. I know things are going to change. I know things are going to be okay, but I don't know that I have the energy to put into all of that so much anymore on a world scale with my clients. Yes. Cause that's one-on-one, but I'm, I'm ready. You know, I have lived longer than anybody in my family by a long shot and I am more than ready. The, the difficulty is I'm healthy as a horse. And part of that is having had my MD. Do you believe in reincarnation? Oh, yes. Have you accessed any of your past lives? Oh, I have. Yes, of course. When For me, when I got on the path and I was questioning, I wanted to know everything, experience everything. See, what is this all about? And it was fascinating. I, I was like an addict. I couldn't stop. And I, I have had numerous... Um, visions of past lives and stuff. I've been, I was in a cathedral in Bath, England, and I went into full vision mode, which wasn't something I tried to do or necessarily wanted to do, but had a past life where I was being put to death, had the wooden yoke on, and they threw me into the water, and and I was fascinated looking up at the glistening of the sun coming through the water and the particles. And I didn't even care that I was dying. I was just fascinated with all of that because I guess I had just known that it was going to be okay. So, 
Yeah, I've had quite a few of those. So I, I'm a firm believer in it. I've done regression therapy and stuff, and yeah. So I would assume then that what you're doing now is your passion and your purpose. Yes, it is absolutely my passion, my purpose. If I couldn't do it, I wouldn't want to be here. That's how divine it feels for me. I love working with people and and having that kind of intimate connection with them, you know, where I'm able to make a difference in their experience. Do you think it's possible that you planned this NDE pre-birth? Gee, I never thought of that. I don't know if I did. Good for me. Or at least to get you back on track. Yes. And, and that's what it was. It, got, it was the, the universal butt kick that I needed because I, my, my head was so skewed in hurt and anger and victimization and whatnot. And I didn't know how to get out of it because I was in constant connection with my monkey mind. You know, it was telling me everything. And it was pretty devastating for me. And having the near-death experience, as crazy as it was for me in a lot of ways, because I really thought I was mentally ill, until I got the people who could explain to me what was happening and made it okay. Um, I, I, I am so grateful for the experience and the people that guided me along the way and the growth that I was able to have with it. And, you know, I, I'm just in gratitude all the time. I've had a wonderful run. Has the memory of your NDE faded over the years? I'm in it. The minute I talk about it, I'm, I'm there. That's so surprising because at almost 76, you know, the memory is not as fabulous as it used to be. And with that, I'm, I'm in the experience. It's not a memory. I'm in the experience. Do you feel like the other side was more real than here? And this is the dream? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there was such a knowing of the other side when I was there. It was like, yes. You know, like when the, the, the monk spoke to me, he didn't speak to me. He spoke through me and I spoke through him. And that was all normal and natural. That was like, of course, that's what we do. Would you say that this, you're... this is the dream? Was your communication telepathic? I guess it was. Yes. When I say it felt like it was inside of me. So, you know, I have hearing and seeing modalities. So, yeah. Would you go as far as saying at the instant that you asked the question, you received the answer? Yes. It was just there. Everything was there. Anything you needed to know was there. What do you think inspires you about your NDE? The NDE took away all the things that were anxiety producing for me for the most part. You know, I don't have fear of death. That's usually number one for people. I feel loved all on my own. I feel loved. I feel, I feel God's gratitude for me. You know, I, I've been a single woman for 31 years. I've been on my own. I've been married twice. And I feel so supported by the universe that I don't feel the need for a partner. I mean, it'd be nice to have a partner to play with and do things and, you know, but there's no need. I don't need filled up from anything. And I'm very grateful for that. Do you think it's possible that you have an expectation of love from a partner that's unrealistic comparing it to the love that you felt on the other side? Oh, I'm sure. Um, I don't now. I haven't for years had that. But, you know, I grew up thinking a partner completes you kind of thing, which is ludicrous. But that's what I knew at that point. Um, no, I, I, but I know that I need a partner who understands my depth of connection doesn't have to have it on their own, but 
is supportive of mine. And who wants similar things in life like I do, you know, that heart connection, that appreciation, being in gratitude, that kind of stuff. I, I need somebody who's in that mindset. You know, probably somebody who's more of my soul group. It's interesting that you came to those words, soul group. Have you identified any members of your soul group here on oh, this side? Oh, I have. Yeah. Are yeah. they family members? Possibly. I would have thought more so, but it's been friends more than family who have been my soul group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when when you're with them, there's just an in sync interaction. You know, it's like almost being on the other side. You you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to you don't have to show it. You don't have to ask for it or do it. It's just part of it. All right. And sometimes those meetings of soul group people are just for a short period of time, you know, 15 minutes or whatever. It's a touch base kind of thing. You didn't mention knowing the monks, but do you think any of them could have been members of your soul group? No, none of them feel like that. No. There was no familiarity in that way. There was a knowingness, but not a familiarity. Do you think when you experienced the light, that was God? Oh, I would say so. And I, I kind of felt like that one monk that communicated with me was a form of God. Okay. The light was the unconditional love. And somehow that's a part of, but not all of. It was interesting when I was floating between the rows of the monks, I could feel them radiating love to me. What a divine experience that was. I mean, here I'd been a model and, you know, people had thought whatever they thought of me in, in the good sense, you know, looking up at me and blah, 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 or in front of a camera and, oh, yeah, that's great or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I'm in this place where these monks are radiating love to me. It, it so transcended anything I'd ever experienced as a human being. It's just our human experience pales in comparison. That's why I'm excited for going home. I'm not scared. I'm not threatened. I'm not worried. Don't want to be sick, you know, don't want to go through pain and suffering necessarily. But I know there's so much more. And there's so much more here. That was the thing I, I needed to get from my near death experience was to find heaven here. Because there isn't on the other side. It's not that. And there's no hell, of course, on the other side. That's here. Of our own making, yeah. In my opinion, when you first transitioned out of the operating room, you went to what people call the black void. And it was completely black. Would you say it would be even almost velvety? It's interesting that you say that. It, it, I never thought of it as having a texture, but as I'm sensing it right now, it could be. Yeah. I mean, my overriding sense was my fear my childhood stuff was coming up big time and so I really didn't take in the fabric of it but as I'm tuning into it right now I, I I would say you could sense that it was that kind of deep blackness as black velvet and most people talk about how scary the blackness is if I didn't have the childhood fear about being in the dark, it wouldn't have been scary. I mean, the, it, it wasn't emanating anything scary to me. It was just it was just a portal. It was a transitional place. I think a lot of times guests will talk about that our biggest problem in general, or one of them, is fear. Yeah. And to try to replace fear with love. Can you comment on well, that? 
I don't replace fear with love. There has to be, for me, a segue. So I use this analogy. F-E-A-R stands for forgetting everything's all right. We're projecting out into the future where we have no power. We're going to the past where we have no power. We have to learn to stay in our own lane, which is here in the present. In the present, there is no fear. You and I are having a conversation. There's nothing else besides you and me right here, right now. If we can learn to do that more often, it will change everything. You can't bring love in if you're not dealing with the reason you're having the fear. Now, they say you can't have fear and love at the same time. I agree to that. But how do you transition from fear, abject fear, to love? You can't necessarily conjure it in, in your abilities. Some people can. Um, I had to understand why I was having the fear. What was I doing that created that in me that overwhelmed me so much? And then I realized I'm talking to myself about stuff that could happen in the future or never happen. And I'm I'm going through this whole scenario out there that makes no sense because it's not happening in real time. It might never happen. Bring myself back. I bring myself back every time. Am I, are my needs and wants met here in this moment? Yes. Am I safe in this moment? Yes. Is there a tiger chasing after me? No. I have to quiet my body. The only way I can quiet my body is to tell my body the truth. I am loved. I am safe. My needs and wants are met. I have gifts and abilities. I have choice. And once I do that, things kind of calm down enough for me to be more rational, for me to be more in touch with my intuition. And that's where we need to be. And I tell my clients, the heart and the solar plexus, intuition, that's our Geiger counter. That's our GPS. Go with that. Don't go with it. It'll lie to you all day long. Use it to do your work, but don't ask it questions. Feel your way. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you. Are you up for that? Oh, I'd love that. I love working with people. Yeah. I, if I say I live for that, does that sound too uh, <laughs> silly? Because I do. I love the work that I do with people. What's the best way to reach you? Through my website, guidingyourspirit.com. And my email is Diane, D-I-A-N-N-E, at guidingyourspirit.com. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want us to know about? Hopefully a book. I stopped and started it several times. And I, that's where I grapple with ego. I'm, you know, do I really, do people really need to hear this? But I'm, I'm realizing there are some truths that I have that might help people be in a better place, enjoy their lives more. So, yeah, I, I just have to sit down and stop being silly about it. Maybe I'll find a ghostwriter and get it done. Well, Diane, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? You know, Carl Sagan talks about the fact that we are made out of the same stuff as stars. So how spectacular is that? How can we play small? And how can we not shine when we know that as a truth? That's science. Now, I know that we are spectacular because we're all part of the same energy. And no matter what we've chosen or not chosen in our lives, we're still worthy of love and deserving love. And we have to carry ourselves in that kind of tenderness and love for ourselves. Because it's not easy being a human being. You know? And sometimes we just have to say, good for me. Or... It's okay. Next time we'll do it differently. You know, just be tender with yourself. Have fun with yourself. You deserve to be happy. It's your birthright. Diane, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. 
Ah, oh, it's been lovely being with you. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.